what this scene represents musically, and we are going to be talking about the music, we're not really going to talk about the film that much, we're going to talk about the background. But what that represented there over the years has been absorbed by, and in many cases transformed, Nashville in the, in the ensuing decades. And uh, sort of what that represented, a lot of that lives here now. And I'm happy to say we're very lucky to have two of the shining examples of that right here and Fred and Janice and Mike. <laughs> but people who represent how that era and the spirit of the music there manifested itself here in various two very individual ways. Um, so before I get to the first question, I also want to say that I think it's good to point out that the Cone Brothers and the people around them have never pre pretended that this was a historically accurate representation, particularly the actual people. And as much as they're into period detail, even that, they have been known more than they do in this film. They've been known to skew the period detail for their own purposes of entertainment. So we're not talking about what was intended to be an accurate representation of this era. But meanwhile, we're going to talk about the real era as you know it. So Dennis, I'd like to ask you, you were around pretty much from this era, or at least a year or two after, at the age of um, we lived in New Jersey, but my folks were very uh, pico commies, I guess you would say. And so we used to go into New York a lot and visit my grandparents, and we would go down to the village. I remember the first time I was seven, so that would have been 58 or 59. And I remember that it blew me away because there were so many different colors of people on the sidewalks everywhere. It was the most integrated place I had ever been. And there were people singing all over the place. And there were gay people, which I'd never seen before either, uh, and cross-dressers. You know, at seven years old, and then from seven to ten, we went probably once a month so that my dad could stand with the guitar in Washington Square Park and sing folk songs. It was a revelation. I mean, it was, it was so magical, and it was so alive, and you felt like you had just stepped into a completely different country of really magical, joyous moments. Just, just briefly, I have to say from our conversations, you do not feel that that was adequately, if at all, represented. And just the background scenes of the movie, let alone the diversity of yeah, what you do. Yeah, you know, I don't really care. I mean, I thought the sets were amazing. The, the, the fidelity to the Upper West Side Jewish people that I grew up around. Um, the fact that he got beat up by somebody for yelling at somebody. Normally people would get beat up because they were Stalinists rather than Trotskyites. You can really <laughs> see a lot of that otherwise. Um, I, I don't really care. I mean, just so you know, historically, the gaslight had the toilet in the center of the room. <laughs> so there were walls around it, but you couldn't flush it when anybody was on stage. <laughs> so there were little things like that that, you know, I'm almost grateful they didn't. They have signs around the toilet. <laughs> no, because if you, if you opened your mouth in those places, somebody would punch you. We were all very serious. We have a curling in the house, so we yes, can make we a do. joke about the bluebird, but we don't. Yeah. <laughs> um, moving on, as, as most of you, if anybody's read much of anything about this at all, the movie itself, as far as there, obviously, they take the setting of the Greenwich Village folk scene seriously without trying to be slavishly accurate to it. But the fact that the main character is very, very, very loosely based on Dave Van Ronk, and the character traits, nothing about the person represents him. The fact that he was a merchant seaman, the fact that there were... People slept on Dave Van Ronk's couch. He didn't sleep on other people's couches. I believe that's correct. But, but um, the, the, the fact that Dave Van Ronk enters into it is that his memoirs and his stories were so colorful that they first inspired the idea of the movie. But the character is very different from Dave Van Ronk, but both of you knew Dave Van Ronk. And Fred, you, you got to know him a little, just a little after this period. What was your introduction to him? What are your most striking impressions? Dave Van Ronk was a mentor. He was always encouraging the people. He, you know, he never told me when he and Paxton first heard Dylan, which is basically the last scene of this movie. And other people were really not pushing Bob Dylan at the time. It was a, an odd voice. It, a, a lot of the music that was being played was coming from professional singers like a Bob Gibson or... Pretty. Uh, yeah. Pretty. You know, uh, you had the Weavers, you had sort of your political sort of singers, but they weren't playing the village. And uh, Dave was uh, coming out of a jazz tradition 
You can talk to him. Uh, Mayor of McDougal Street is a wonderful book. It really reflects Dave's true personality, and I, I highly recommend There's a copy right there. Uh, the other great thing about Dave is before he'd sing any song, there were wonderful stories. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't want to open for him because you hear the same joke and story about 47 times, which I did, but Dave was always, uh, he was one of the first people to play Joni Mitchell's music. He was one of the first people to, Back yeah, you know, expose it just so much to a, a, a genre that at the time was a lot of child ballads and minor key songs. The kind of songs that this performer is performing were so far removed from Dave, who was known for his ragtime guitar and all that sort of thing. But uh, I, like, like Janice says, I feel they really captured the vibe of the village. But you need to remember that Greenwich Village at the time was kind of like what East Nashville is now. It was people supporting each other's music. And if Karen Dalton was playing here or Fred Neal or that, people would wander from one gate to another. Yeah, we all go to They were hanging out Washington. together. I have friends from 40 years ago, if I wanted to call them right now, I would call the kettle of fish, and they'll probably call me back by tomorrow morning. I mean, there's, the people who stayed there are very true to that whole scene. It's a, and, you know, so, Dan, uh, you're, uh, you got introduced today very early. You say he's an early mentor. He was. The one story, and uh, Janice has actually a book, her own memoirs, which is a Society's Child, mm -hmm. the book. Excellent overview of some of the scene and her own incredible story beyond that and how it connects to many, many things musically. But uh, you tell a story in that book about hanging out with your mom and Dave Van Ronk talking politics. Yeah. See, see, the thing about Van Ronk, and part of what is really hard to explain to anybody growing up now when you have so much music available in so many different genres, is that everything was so codified. So when I, at 13, hit the village as a singer, and then had the nerve to have a hit record a year and a half later, a lot of the folk singers were really angry with me. And Dave defended me. So he called me and had me come to his house. And my mom made me take a friend because he had a reputation for being a notorious loser. And he met me with his wife. And he was absolutely lovely. He was a perfect gentleman. But then he really liked my mom, so they would sit in the kettle of fish, and Dave would drink whiskey, and my mom would drink um, Brandy Alexander's, and they would argue over politics. And they would end up yelling and singing the Internationale, which is the commun and the Communist Workers song, together, while I tried to hide behind the, um, behind the record player and the jukebox and pretend that I wasn't with them. And I was 14, 15 years old. And they would usually close the bar and they would walk out arm in arm and Dave would be yelling at me, you wait until they come for you! <laughs> but the other great thing he did for me was when I was 15 and a half and in Philly, he was playing there and he was staying with me and a friend of mine. Um, and he took me aside very seriously and he asked if I was still a virgin. And I said yes. And he said, and you had to know him to understand that this was not offensive in any way. He said, if you need somebody to pop your cherry and you would allow me, I will be gentle and it will be a good experience. <laughs> what do you say to that? I mean, I, I just said, thank you. <laughs> I've heard from other female performers that he continued that late into... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know. Okay, yeah, yeah. This is why it's songwriter. Hold the mic up. All right, well, you <laughs> I'm pretty sure we could spend the next hour talking. I would love to hear, we may have to do it somewhere else, but Dave and Wrong stories from the both of you. I want to move on to one other character in the film, and I'm forgetting the... Uh, Paxton. Yeah, what was, the, what, what was the character's name? But the, the, guy the, the, Fort, the guy from Fort Dix, the general guy in the army uniform who sang the last thing on my mind, which was Tom Paxton's, one of his signature songs. He had several of them. But that character was just a little more reflective of the real guy, I think, than the Van Ronk character. It seemed to reflect that. And I would like both your ideas of how he was portrayed in the film and your knowledge of him. And I will say, both of you have worked with him recently. You have a song in his new record? Oh yeah, I wrote his, his Christmas single is the song you know, I wrote. This guy is still around minutes. acting, I mean, performing. Janice, is, you're doing a tour in England? We, we tour a lot together, Tom and I, yeah. The so, thing, Van Ronk wasn't a songwriter. He wrote a few songs. Tom Paxton immediately 
was writing songs like Lasting in My Mind, Wonderful Toy, Chad Mitchell Trio, Tom. Peter Paul and Mary yeah, Bastard. Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> Can't help but wonder what I'm doing. Bottle of Wine. He hit a country hit when everyone else was village folkies and still out there. So Tom was, a, was always a, one of the first songwriters, songwriters. And, ve and very straight, very conservative, very much middle America, you know, did a stint in the army and then hitchhiked to the village and pulled his guitar out of its case. From Oklahoma? And, yeah. I'm curious, is, was his very mild-mannered, well-spoken persona in the film, was that fairly true to life? He's still like that. Yeah. Okay. So that was a character that they made an effort to make, unlike Van Rock, which is nothing like the Yeah, but I, I didn't know that Tom was as dim-witted as this boy. Oh, that's, a, <laughs> that's a Coen Brothers specialty. They like for us to look down on dim-witted people, and I love the Coen Brothers. And, and Dave was like a really genial curmudgeon. I mean, he, he, he could just, you know, say a few words and you go, That was the workers. Yeah, there you go. Let me go back just a second. You uh, you talked about your mom and Dave Van Rock arguing politics. I want to point out, but I'm suspecting that this is. I'm sure it's not. You know, Goldwater versus Johnson or Kennedy versus Nixon. This is no, this is sectarian friends. thing. This is between the Trotskyists and the Communist Party and the, the Shockmanites. Or the Trotsky, Trotsky, Stalinist fights. Yeah. Back, back then, if I remember, it was like. The closer you were in your political views, the more, the more virulently you would argue with each other over splitting yes. hairs. My, would you, and I would say to my mother, you know, Marx wrote a book called The World Without Jews, and she would go, just be quiet. <laughs> you know, and, and those, I mean, as important as politics is to us now, then we were coming out of HUAC, we were coming out of the House on American Activities Committee. There were people who, thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of people had lost their jobs, had lost any source of income because there were all these witch hunts going on. And then you would have a Dave Van Rock yelling, up the workers, on every street corner. So there was something very liberating about watching that, too. There were, there were a lot of brave people in the village, which was one of the things that I didn't get from this. There were a lot of people who were on the outskirts of the rest of the world, outlaws. And they gravitated to the village because they could be themselves and they could usually find other people like them to be with, or at least a good argument. So you, you wouldn't have had uh, the sameness like in this. I think Allison wants to take a few questions from the audience, and then we're going to get back to one more sort of line of questions to close out. It's a very patient number. <laughs> So raise your hand if you have a question. Yes, here we go. Yeah. Hi there. And like, um, I was also down in, in the village, in the East Village back in the 60s, but I just wondered if you knew whether Bud Grossman was really Al Grossman. He was much nicer than Albert. I'm sorry? In the film, he's much nicer than Albert. Right, but was that who he, yes. was, that who he was supposed to be? Okay, more and all that stuff. Uh, Albert Grossman owned the Gate of Horn, yeah, but then he wound up managing Dylan and kind of guiding that. Probably, probably, so probably was accurate for the period as far as his role. The record label guy who I well know as a scene really reminded me a lot of the Richmond Organization, which was the publisher of Woody Guthrie, Shel Silverstein, and a, a lot of really different writers. It was run by people who even in the 90s still using wire recorders. I remember calling there to find out about songs I'd worked on Sheldon. This very New York woman would answer the phone and go, well, we don't know what it is, but uh, we just came back from Europe. We got the American right to this band called Floyd, that's some big Floyd. <laughs> and there was the tiny office just like that, that they completely out of touch with the rest of the world, but keeping these songs going. And, when you talk a little about broadside, sing out, and how, you know, it all started in the village, then we spreading out to other parts of the country where you get to see a publication that talked about this music. Dave Gar, fabulous New York photographer. Many of the scenes in this movie are taken from another wonderful book called The Face of Folk Music. I was just thinking. Or the pictures of um, the inside of the Will and Davis album cover, that shot of Dave and Susan Matola and Dylan with the tiger on the street. Uh, you can just see where the Coens pulled their images uh, from those kind of documents, which I would suggest anyone who likes this movie to study to really see uh, a 
closer. We look at the real people who are there. We have another question back here. I have a question and a comment. Uh, the question is, putting Dave Van Rump, Bob Dylan, Tom Paxton aside, was this any, in any way an accurate depiction of what folk singers went through? Or was there, met, or was there were there more networks um, and support than this yes. movie suggests? Yes, tons. Okay, and my comment, I'm sorry to say because I'm an older woman, is that there's a big difference at the time between Shacklinites and communists. It's the difference between democracy and totalitarianism. And so I think that's a big difference. Trotskyism, a form of Trotskyism. Oh. You can have secondary argument, right? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Other okay. questions? Yeah, we've got one back here. Yeah, I didn't get to the village until 1970. But uh, I just wonder if you had any uh, comments about the uh, mood in this movie, what, how much you see that as the Collins and how much you, you, you see it as that time. The village was Italian. There were, every time I'd get there, people were hanging out in the Italian restaurant, even the cafes. They should have shown a cast of characters from the Sopranos sitting at the back end <laughs> staring at the folk singers. Those are the guys who ran the music industry. Yeah, you know, what's going on here? I love those guys. You always knew where you stood with them. And, you know, uh, it was a, a well lit place. It wasn't quite as blank and dark. <laughs> Uh, you know, it, I mean, for, for myself, essentially, I, and I'm going to post my own review on my Facebook page later tonight because my partner told me not to say it in public here. <laughs> I'd like to play this as Lincoln. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm debating whether I'm just not deep enough to get this or whether it's the Emperor's New Clothes, really. Because I, I love a lot of the Coen Brothers films. Barton Fink, to me, is one of the great films of all time. Um, and yet, and, and if you want to make films about somebody, you go, okay, the guy's a wanker. Then that's what this film says to me. But you know, I, I, I really wonder, I really wonder whether part of the heavy emphasis on Greenwich Village, when most of it doesn't take place there, a lot of it is not in Greenwich Village, when he is obviously not a big part of the village scene, but only with a couple of characters here and there, I wonder if the emphasis on Greenwich Village is because there was nothing else to hang it on. And it's a really great publicity angle. I just really, I don't know, to me the whole film was very much Emperor's New Clothes. But that's me, and like I said, my favorite film is Terminator, so probably I'm just <laughs> <laughs> We have uh, one more question back here, and then maybe Pete, you could text one. Uh, Janice, I just wonder how you, how you felt it, it seemed like the, the main characters were the men. And you were, you had an early hit, and I wonder if it was, like, what it was like, it was, Small clubs, and you immediately start moving to bigger auditoriums. I mean, the scene is so different now. You see the small clubs, and now you see these huge arenas. I mean, it's just, and I just wanted to did, did gradually grow up. Or? Well, for me, I was so young that it moved pretty fast. I mean, I had to get a record within a year, so it was real different. But I remember Van Rock talking about how he and Dylan used to dream of a day when they could play six nights a week. And we played two shows a night, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Sunday, and three shows a night, Friday and Saturday. When you played the gate of horn, Bob Gibson would play there for a month. Yeah. The first couple of weeks you might not have a big audience, but by the end of the run, hopefully you had built up a crowd. It's not like you played the Bolivar once every six months or three years. You came in and built an audience. And you didn't have the media that you have now, you know, which I think is a really easy thing to forget because there there was uh, there was no crowd daddy, there was no Rolling Stone magazine. If you got in the Magazines you got in Life, Look, Time, or Newsweek. That was pretty much it. Or the teen screen magazines. So you didn't have the media push that you have now. There were only seven TV channels in New York. I mean, in the rest of the country, there were four and five. So you had to develop an audience. You had to develop a regional base. I mean, even I did. You know, I played the main point every three months or four months. I played the Gaslight um, my first summer. I was for Gary Davis for 10 days. And then two months later, I headlined. But it wasn't because I was big, it was because the owner of the Gaslight felt that I was worthy and wanted to help me develop an audience. But you played there, where did you have like Leonard Bernstein and Johnny Mercer in the audience? 
Yeah. <laughs> Different crowd the tonight. No, but also the tourists. I mean, one of the great fun things to do in the village in those days was to go and watch the tourist buses go by and moon them. You know, or yell at them. You know, have them come off the bus and say, oh my god, I wouldn't want my sister to marry one. I mean, we were, the village was full of people who were just acting out in very big, giant, flagrant, serious, fun ways. And they were coming out of the beatnik thing. My dear friend Cheryl Silverstein was writing for the Irish Rovers and all that. Kept the place in the village for years. And he dared his roommate, listen, I'm going to write a song. The first song he wrote was the unicorn song, and his roommate wrote Thousand Clowns or Gardner. But they were all interacting with Gene Shepherd or this person, that person, all the, the world of theater and art and right, music. Right, music. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of interreaction. I mean, I mean, all the cross fertilization was amazing because you'd be talking at, at, a, at a club and you'd be sitting down and having a coffee and you'd be talking to an artist, you know, a visual artist, and then somebody at the next table would say, oh my god, but I saw that painting, and I did this and I did that, and suddenly you'd have an architect at the table, you'd have five or six or eight or ten different genres, and they were all feeding each other. It was like Paris, at the heyday of Paris for the arts. I'm getting a signal to wrap things up. I have one, one other theme. Do I have time to? Yeah, yeah. One other theme I want to come, I sort of started with, I want to come back to, which will bring both this story into the present and into Nashville and tie in your own careers. Uh, if, I, if I can do this in a cohesive way, like to me, you mentioned, somebody mentioned, you mentioned that uh, last thing on my mind was we heard the Tom Paxton character do. That was the first hit, as isolated as this whole scene was from Nashville at the time. Within a few years, there was all this ferment and interaction. There was Bobby Bear and Early Way, and all these people were starting to cut, even and Sylvia, they were starting to cut people that were, and it was still a separate world. And of course, Bob Dylan famously came here at Owens Up and other can worms. The very first, I think this, this just made a connection for me, the very first uh, Dolly Parton and Porter Wagner duet hit was the last thing on my mind. And it was also, coincidentally, it was uh, Dolly Parton's first top ten hit, and, you know, 40 years later, here she is with the Tom Paxton song. It's, there's, this all starts to have a connection. In the late 80s, you had Nancy Griffith and Lyle Lovett and uh, Oh, Mary Jane Carpenter, John Prime who's here. You have all these things that have a strong basis in this old default mentality of at least the people writing their own songs and you guys are moving here. So I'm, I want to kind of form this in, in two questions to wrap up. And Fred, you wrote like some songs for Kathy Matei that had a very, very strong folk vibe and were huge. I was told this song they were gonna record this song. And they were huge song. country hits and you were writing songs for John Prime and you brought what you had from this experience into Nashville over, I don't want to stress well, this, but over the first people in Denver, like John Hartford and the Glazers, and people, Glazers could have been a folk group. Easily. It's only like, we're considered in that. And the great thing is that Last Thing in My Mind is still a current song now as it was when yeah. the first wrote. But that's the way I was show this is people call it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, Thanks, I've got one last question for you, which sort of we talked about this briefly in the email the other day. In the scene article on your children's book, you had a thing that really touched me because I grew up, I was an eight year old folky snob. I was kind of around the scene. I, was, I couldn't participate. But, but I, I, I res this period resonates with me very deeply. And you mentioned something in this article in your children's book about really encouraging. The way you set it up with the interactive or whatever, I don't remember, was encouraging people to sing themselves. Kids, music is for people to make themselves. It's not something you just consume. And this is such a central part of what this is, and you don't talk about it much because the tension was always there between music is something that we do, you sing together at parties, it's something that people do for themselves. At the same time, there's a tension is that all of us depend on people consuming our product as performers. And there's a tension there that's always been there, and it's vaguely touched on here. And I think you've done as good a job of anybody as keeping your eyes on this sort of idealistic side of it while making a career as a singer and songwriter. So I'm just curious how you see that tension. But there used to be this huge schism between people who sang traditional quote unquote folk songs and people like myself. But I think what people like me have come to realize is that we're on a very slippery slope right now because kids are growing up watching people on TV 
sing, and they're getting the impression that you have to be good in order to sing, and you have to play well in order to play. And it's a very dangerous, slippery slope for, for a civilization, I think, because we sing because it makes our hearts feel bad. We don't sing because we're going to become famous. We make music because it makes us feel glad, not because we're going to make a record. And with the cutbacks in schools and cutbacks here and there, I think we're, we're in great danger of losing what gives birth to new art forms and what gives birth to new artists, which is singing in school and singing at home and singing with your friends. And I don't know how much you can do really to combat that, but in, in my little way, I make tons of free I call it Janice Eden stuff, available on my website. And with this book, The Tiny Mouse, if you're a kid, you can go on the website, you can download the music, you can download a karaoke version and sing along with it. It's just trying to get kids out of the mindset that they've got to be dressed like superstars to be able to enjoy singing, because music is just so good for you. To me, that brings us full circle to what was often the unspoken thing behind these people where it all started. Here we see in the movie, we see the careerist impulses of how do we make the joy of singing in the living room with our friends, maybe make a career of it. That's what the movie kind of addresses. But what you talk about is the actual essence of that scene. I think that's a great place to stop. Is that we all, people should encourage each other to make music, encourage, encourage their kids. That doesn't mean you should stop going to see me playing clubs. You should keep buying everybody's records. You should absolutely buy Janice's book, Society's Child, for more stories like this. And the, the Mayor of McDougal Street, which is a posthumous memoir of Dave Van Rock, which is the real roots of this movie. And if you like the Dave Van Rock stories, this will keep you up late at night laughing and swearing and whatever else. I'll tell you that we made a record of the story just listen to his voice and the stories were wonderful. I don't know, I, 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 I get too tied into it. Too. I, I listen to it, but then I think of him and then I remember it. So it's a different thing. And I noticed in the movie that the Paxton character, who, as Janice knows, Paxton can sing three words and everyone in the room is going to be singing along. That's, that's a real is art. not a sing along. Neither am I. Yeah. I mean, that, yeah. it's just, that's a talent that some of us have and some of us don't. I, I could never do the beat singer thing. I would be awful. Can you imagine? Okay, everybody now. <laughs> but, but it's really, my partner, my wife cannot carry a tune to save her life. I mean, if, if somebody was standing there with a gun and said, carry the tune, she would be shot. And at first it bothered me because she really loves singing. And you know, I come from a professional place. But what I came to realize is that she takes such joy in it, a joy that I had lost at that point. She takes such joy in just belting out Adele, you know, anything. <laughs> and who was I to say that that wasn't okay? And that really started me going right back to my roots of you sing to make your heart feel glad. And now we sing in the car, and I always sound fantastic next year. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much.